you tonight. I don't think you've ever read the birth narratives and, and, and thought about some of the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. And there's some very significant, very interesting issues. Uh, you know, we'll go as far as we can go without rushing. Uh, but, um, you know, so that's what's on the agenda for me tonight. Uh, Reverend Dr. Kelsey, I believe, has, uh, has the handout from last week that he did not uh, finish. Uh, but I'd like to just um, start with a scripture reading, and then we'll uh, go to prayer, and then I'll hand it off to Reverend Dr. Kelsey. And I'll put this microphone close to you, Doctor, so everybody can hear you, uh, even those that are in the back. I'm going to read from uh, the book of Micah, and I'm going to be in chapter 5 of the book of Micah. This has relevance to the birth narratives and some of the things that we'll be talking about tonight. It says, A promised ruler from Bethlehem. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Arathen, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old and from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely for his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these beautiful promises of hope uh, for not only the nation of Israel, but for the world. And we thank you that there was this great promise that God would send us a Messiah, God would send us a Savior that would be able to reconcile humanity with God and be the propitiation for all of our sins, that we can have right standing with God and we can live as children of God. And today, Lord, as we discuss and begin the Synoptic Gospels and talk about the birth narratives, what an awesome thing many of the prophecies were leading up to this particular birth, this unique birth, this birth that was once and for all that happened when Jesus was born. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask that you illuminate our minds, let us be able to comprehend some of the complex nuances with Scripture, with the birth narratives, and with the Synoptic Gospels. We thank you for this evening. We ask that you bless all those that are here, and we ask those that are uh, leading the class and leading the discussions. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the things that I want to do is not go through century by century. I want to make sure that we get things along the way. I want us to get the feel about places. I want us to feel the people and what they were facing and to see some of the struggles. Now, we have a political struggle going on right now. Uh, I forget who one person is, Hillary, I think, somebody else is trying to run to be president. You know, and you couldn't be living in this century without knowing the significance of what's before us and knowing something about the people who are running to say, we are the ones that can lead you into the wilderness and feed you the way you want to be fed. So we want to learn some of those things. Now, just as we have things happening today, in the first century, there were also things happening. And one of the big things, uh, like a real marker, is when Jerusalem fell to the Romans. That was a big thing. Everybody was worried about that. Everybody was thinking about that. What's going to happen if Jerusalem falls? Who, who's, who's going to be there? Who are the people involved? I mean, did they have a Donald Trump back there? Did they have a Hillary Clinton? Well, my own reading of history is that they had a couple guys that were worse, <laughs> but that's hard to be. Nero. So let's think about Nero. He was one of the leaders of the Roman Empire. 
Nero. Can you imagine that he was there and he was such a wicked man. He was wicked with the relationships between other people in, in a very unclean, un, a very bad way. And he used to get up on the play and act as an actor and act some of those uh, vile things. Now, that was Nero. And Nero was one who uh, was ruling in Rome. You got to know Nero. You have to know something about him. The most wicked of all the, I think, of all the uh, emper emperors who were down there. Nero. And he would uh, do bad things to everybody. So one night, uh, he got in some trouble and he decided he had to uh, take care of the city. And he wanted to light up the streets of the city of Jerusalem. And it's hard to burn down a stone city, but they really can do a lot of destruction by throwing stuff in through windows and getting this stuff inside the houses, burning. It's, it's a horrible thing. But there Nero was. He saw that people were getting against him. And he was playing his violin, and he, they used to talk about Nero fiddling along when Rome was burning. So we've got to think of who are the people we're going to bump into or hope that we never have to bump into them in that first century. The year is 70 AD. That's when we're taught what we're talking about. And Josephus writes about this. Now you might hear Flavius Josephus, and he's a strange guy. Isn't it interesting you get some people ruling an empire and their eyeballs, they're strange. But here we got Josephus. In fact, he wanted to become so Roman that he took one of the names of the Romans and put it at the beginning, Flavius Josephus, to make it look like he's with them. But, but he had some strange things happen to him. First of all, he was up in the northern part of the kingdom. Does anyone know what it, body of water is up there? No, that's the south. In the north, sea of, Galilee. sea of Galilee. And he was up along the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee had brought the empire right down to that water and that's where the disciples were fishing in the Sea of Galilee. They wouldn't fish in the Dead Sea because nothing is alive in the Dead Sea. Maybe that's why they named it the Dead Sea. Anyway, it was, uh, Josephus became a great writer. He says he was a great writer of Jewish history. And he wanted to write everything that happened to the people. So he takes some really old things from the uh, Old Testament period. Uh, he wrote about their victories and their losses. Uh, he came, continued to write, and then he wanted to be like a Caesar, but he was just a writer. Now, I don't, don't say just a writer, because maybe some of you make your living writing. They might make their living writing. I, I don't, but he's got a book coming out, so he'll be able to retire from law with his book. But uh, Josephus, he, he was a writer. And you often will see in New Testament commentaries ref references to Josephus and what he said about a certain thing. Well, he was trying to keep away from the Israelis, and away from the Romans. And he was trying to please both sectors, both groups. So he's really playing up to the Greeks and the Romans, and he was playing up to the Palestinians and the Arabs in that area. And Josephus 
he'll tell you all kind of stuff. Whether you want to know it or not, he's got it down. And so they were hunting for him. The Romans thought that he was leading the opposition. And so what did the Josephus did? He jumped into a cistern and he hid in a cistern. And the Romans came around looking. They didn't think that a human being could stay in a cistern and not drown. So they didn't even bother looking that there. But that's where Josephus was. So what, does, what kind of guy was this anyway? Jump in a cistern and hide? And the next thing you know, he gets out and he talks to the Romans, I'm one of your most faithful servants. And they say, oh, well, that's good. And so they sent him back to Rome, and in Rome the emperor, emperor there said, Josephus, you're such a good writer. Why don't you keep on writing the history of the Jewish people? And uh, tell, someone tell me how big a book it came out that he wrote. How many, how many pages? Oh, about a thousand. About a thousand pages that he wrote <coughs> on the Jewish people. I'll bring it in next week. Oh, okay. And then during the weekend, uh, John can read it and bring it back. Sure. No it can take you all week just to get through first five or ten pages. It's not the most uh, interesting thing to read. But it's got all these things. And next thing you know, here this rebel that the Romans were hunting, wanting to shoot or wanting to get rid of, they brought him back and gave him a nice house and said, now all you got to do is sit down and write. Write. Write about the Jewish people. And so you get a lot of stuff. So if you ever read anything on New Testament, it's going to talk about Josephus. And he's a, you know, strange guy. He pretended he was with the Romans when he was with the Jews. Pretended he was with the Jews when he was really with the Romans. I mean, it was just a wild time. Yeah. Yes. It's uh, it's it, tradition says that Josephus reported that he saw Jesus after the resurrection, even though he never believed mm -hmm. Jesus as a savior. He witnesses walking around after the resurrection. He yes. That. That's right. And so every once in a while, Josephus, in his writing, says something that corroborates what is in the New Testament, or even the Old Testament. And people like to say, well, look at that. He must have been a Christian. <laughs> but he, he was a, a trickster, pretending that he was with the... Jewish people, and then jumping into a well to hide, escaping from the cistern and getting up to Rome, and the next thing you know, there he has a nice house, and people waiting on him, and all he do, had to do was sit down and write. I, I think it's an amazing thing. Well, uh, Let's see, we got this. It's in the years, in the second paragraph here of G Josephus. One could see the toppled ruins of the temple and the city in flames. Now, it's most likely that Nero got that fire going with his orders and the people who worked for him go out and set it on fire. And they were out lighting up fires all over the place. And they killed quite a few Jewish people and a number of Christians. Because see, at, eight, at 70 AD, the number of Christians from the 30s and the 40s had multiplied, so there were quite a few by 70. In 70 AD, there were some Christians living in Jerusalem and they were kicked out. Or they were arrested and then there were laws that were sent out. No Jew can stay in Italy. None can remain in Rome. And so we see in some places in the New Testament, people came from Rome and they moved to an island in the Mediterranean or somewhere like along the Mediterranean coast. 
that, that's the idea of Josephus. Uh, they were people that were hung up on a, on a, like a pole and set on fire. And it was like they were street lights. And Josephus writes this all down. So we have, uh, you might say, a non-biased writer. Is there such a thing? Could Josephus really be non-biased? Or do you think that because he was uh, beholden to the Romans, he had to make sure that everything he wrote was politically correct for that period of time. And he could change the time he began. If you could write a thousand page book, you can make some changes from the time you first start to the end. Have you ever made a change? Uh, <laughs> yeah, cool. unfortunately, yes. And think poor old Josephus, a thousand pages and writing in this Hebrew, no no what he called it, it was computers and nothing. And, and so it was just a terrible thing. Well, uh, they, Josephus is the one who tells us all about the destruction of Jerusalem, that which was prophesied before, and, and that which was such a, a key point in the history of the Jewish people, and, and in a sense in the history of the Christians, who some of them were also uh, burned to death in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, they had parades, but this guy had split loyalty. Sophia, do you know what split loyalty means? Now, does your brother play on a soccer team? And is there a special team that they like to beat? I mean, they want to beat them all. Oh, okay. So sometimes you might say, oh, he's out there cheering for those people. We don't like those people. We don't want them to win. And this guy's out there. And then he comes out, oh, no, I'm with these. I'm with you guys. And that's split loyalty to say he's with these people and he's with the enemies or the opponents. And that's one thing Josephus, he, he was a real technician in doing that. Um, well, the city was destroyed. The uh, all over the Roman Empire, there were repercussions, as Jewish people had fled from Italy and from Rome, and had gone out east into the empire's outer limits, and they were living there and trying to pretend that they were with this group and that group at the same time. Split loyalties. I hope you don't forget that now, Sophia. Split loyalties as we say you in favor opposite sides. Okay? Now, um, 130 years around this time, the Romans had been ruling and continued to rule the uh, Jewish people. In the 60s, that would be just before the fall of Rome. Remember, 70 AD, the fall of Rome, the destruction of that Roman presence, and so many people were killed there. And all of a sudden, you have the Jew Jewish people increasingly rebellious. They didn't want to be under the rule of the Romans or, or the Jewish people. So anyway, uh, I said, uh, if we were walking along and we bumped into Josephus, what would we say to him? And you know, John's a good writer. What would you say to Josephus? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> you, you think it's a miracle you're alive to see him. I think that he was, but he knew how to be on both sides at the same time. People do it all the time now. Yeah. 
politicians are great. I wonder if they learned from Josephus. Maybe. Maybe it's a traitor. Right. A traitor to both sides. That's right, and you never could trust him. Yeah, you don't really have a side. You're on both sides, you really don't have a side. Right. So that's, that's, that's it. Hypocrite. So this, uh, so if we return to the first century, one guy we want to look up and watch out for, but that's Josephus, and he'll have mischief in his hands. He'll try to do something to us. Well, uh, he, <clears throat> he took a lot of money and put it in his own pocket, but then he came to Jerusalem, he took money from the temple, uh, treasury, people sneered at, his, at him and mocked him. He sent in the Twelfth Legion, and they plundered the marketplace. Now, he's not a nice friend to have, that he sends in a whole bunch of his thugs to plunder the marketplace. Then the real trigger was when uh, Eliezer, the temple leader, declared no further sacrifices for foreigners. Well, wait a minute. They all wanted to have a sacrifice because they all wanted to be accepted with God. If they're not allowed to make a sacrifice, they're going to perish. So that really upset everybody. And uh, But they said, the, the high priest in the temple, no more can we have all these people making these things. And none for Caesar. Some Romans entered the city and were stoned. Stoned? You know how they stoned them? Stoned. All the kids and teenagers and young people like Sophia got on the roof of houses. They had flat roofs on the house. They stood up there and the Roman soldiers were coming and they just kept dropping these big stones on their heads as they walked up the street. I mean, it was a terrible time. You couldn't trust anybody. And maybe some of them just like to see the stone go down and break open the skull of some guy down there. The real trigger was this Eliezer. But I don't think I'm going to look for him. I just want to see Josephus. Because he's the one who caused so much trouble and pretended that he was on both sides at the same time. Uh, so the Romans entered the fortress and they put a siege around it. They offered a troop, a truce. The troops would surrender their weapons. I mean, isn't that amazing? Give us your weapons. It's like us saying to Putin, you want our uh, atomic bombs? We'll give them to you. We can have them. We won't have any. You have them all. And that's what was happening. And they didn't like this. And they, some people they spared and others they slaughtered. It was just, if you hear 70 AD, say it's a good time not to be there because they were really messing things up. And the word of the slaughter reached Rome. Uh, Masada, if you ever take a trip to Israel and Palestine, you'll get a, have an option of taking a little trip down to Masada. Masada was a fortress in the wilderness and not far from the Dead Sea very interesting place, almost impossible to get near it. No wonder it was a nice fortress. And then they captured it. And some people surrendered easily. Some said, I'm not surrendering. And there they were. Well, uh, let's see what we have here in the next paragraph. Uh, Cestus. Uh, he was one of the leaders of the Roman army. He's a soldier, he's not an emperor. 
or a political leader, but he's a, he's a leader of the Roman army. And he came with 32,000 soldiers to attack Jerusalem. I mean, they're, they're in for a real beating. 32,000 soldiers coming. What do we do with them? They tried to appease them. They couldn't appease them. They wanted their people to kill all those other soldiers. Well, as Cestus was setting up camp outside, thousands of unruly Jews came and killed 500 Roman soldiers. Do you think they got happy about that? What happened to Jeremiah? I can't see him. Did he live, go home? He's working the uh, projector. He's oh. working the system. Oh, he's working the system. Yeah. Oh, I better not ask a hard question. But what do you think they do with these 500? These 500 were killed. Roman soldiers. Do you think the other Roman soldiers, they had how many did they have? 32,000. And they came to attack Jerusalem. And there were 500 that the Jews killed right off. And the Romans were not happy about that at all. So that's one of the twists here. Well, it's a mystery in this, this twisting affairs of soldiers and wars. That why did he withdraw? Why did he take his soldiers and take out, or take off? He could have ended the war right then and there. As he withdrew over the hills, his war machines slowed him down. Now they had these big things on wheels that they could go up near the wall of a city and they could stand on top of this little platform that had wheels and, and so soldiers could be way up there in the air throwing stuff down inside the wall of the city and trying to destroy the, the city wall itself. And, and that was one of the things. And the priests were not really good soldiers, but uh, they were on the hills, on top of a hill, and every time they saw a Roman soldier come by, whoosh, a whole gang of stones came raining down on them. Then they figured the Romans would come back and they would come back and they would start in Galilee to clean up Palestine and the Jews. Now, in the first century, the country really had two centers of gravity. Up in Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, and down in Jerusalem. And so here they were in both areas coming along. And the priest, they sent three men, including Josephus. So here we got Josephus being a secret agent for the army. And doesn't that put shivers in your back? You know what a shiver is, don't you? So you got shivers in your back because... Josephus is going to be one of your counselors, one of your helpers. And Josephus had been to Rome. He knew their power and what they could do. He was asked to fight a war that he knew he couldn't win. The Romans were too great for them. So here you got Josephus and all this fighting going on. Another uh, guy from there is named Joseph Gisele, Gisele. He was against Josephus. So here we got a lot of room for intrigue to come along. And the third man was Simon, a champion of the poor. He had taken over the group of men called the Sakara. The Sakara, uh, just in case somebody asked you in school this someday, uh, 
Sophia, yeah, I'll tell you, everybody else knows. But the Sakar were, were a Greek group of men who had a round sword, and they used that to do slaughter. And so that was what they were up to. And so they were they worried about the Sakara. They, they what would we call them? We could say that the parachutists, the army, uh, foot soldiers, whatever it was, there were so many of them, but they were all known by having this round, almost like a sickle, round sword for fighting. Well, let's see, where are we here? We lost our place. Um, so Josephus, well, when I smell, hear his name, I smell trouble, because Josephus was not, not someone good. But he came to Galilee, Vespasian, one of the emperors, was up there with 60,000 people. And maybe next week if I pull it together, I can bring in, I have some things. These guys, army generals, would always take over being Caesar if something happened to Caesar. So here, they were coming from Galilee, that's one center, heading toward Jerusalem, the other center, and as they're heading down that way, they say, wow, we better watch out. There's trouble back in Rome. Caesar's sick. What's going to happen if he dies? And lo and behold, he up and died. And so the Caesar was gone in Jerusalem, uh, in Rome. And when he came, they said, who's going to be the next Caesar? They said, oh, the general leading the people from Galilee down toward Jerusalem. We will put him in and we'll put a new guy in, in charge. And so they took Domitian and made him the Caesar, and they took a soldier named Titus and put him in charge. And Titus, we'll hear a lot about him. He had a great big uh, uh, victory when he came toward Jerusalem. He took a lot of stuff from the temple. He took big stones and pictures and things that were carved out of the stone and took them back to Rome and they rebuilt the triumphant entry uh, gateway into Jerusalem. They rebuilt it in Rome. And uh, I have a picture I took inside of that at Rome. You know, every once in a while I said, man, if I, when I go back here, I took one picture of that. One lousy picture. I should have had 50. But in those days, every single slide, you were paying maybe 20 cents for it, or maybe more. So we didn't take any more pictures than we had to. Well, I wonder what those people 50 years ago would do with a camera that you could take 600 pictures and you, don't, you still haven't changed the film. That's amazing. And we had to take bulbs with us too. I, my luggage was half filled with these bulbs and you had to screw the bulb in to take a flash picture. And one bulb and you throw it away. But this is down there having this fight. Titus came down. Josephus and four of the others jumped in a pit and at the bottom there was a large cave. Well, Somehow, Josephus always knew how to jump off of something and land on his feet. And he surrendered to Titus, the son of Vespasian. And Josephus told him that he and then Titus would eventually be ruling as emperor. Well, when you tell a guy, hey, you're going to rule this kingdom as the emperor. He thinks you're pretty nice. Hey, that's like a nice prophecy for me. And so Titus, 
And I think I have this picture on a coin at home. But Titus won, and he's the one who actually captured Jerusalem and not the other soldiers that were leading the army down from the north. And because that guy ran back and became the emperor. Well, uh, now Titus, he wanted to, you know, be nice, but Josephus told Vespasian that he and then Titus would eventually be ruling as emperors. And they did. Quite a nice prophecy for themselves. Well, what did they do? They left Josephus in chains. That's a nice way to treat the God. He says, you're going to be the emperor. But then they freed him, but cut the chains with an axe. So showed he had been wrongly arrested. Well, I don't want him to put chains around me and then break the chain with an axe. And that will tell everybody who sees me that I was arrested, but it was wrongly arrested. That's why they broke the chains with an axe. Well, now we come down to John Giscala. He returned to Jerusalem and he joined with Simon. The two took over the temple. Now inside of Jerusalem, there were John, Simon, and the priestly rulers. And they're all going to be struggling, fighting with each other. The Idumeans, uh, we don't know much about the Idumeans, except that they lived in the southern desert, south of the Dead Sea, down near where Petra is today. Uh, they couldn't get into, they couldn't get in. During a thunderstorm, John, John opened the door to them and they went on not only to get in, but they went on a rampage. And they got going through there, the streets and slaughtered over 8,500 people including Annas, the high priest, you remember, uh, when you do the synoptics, you get to the end of them, and you'll hear about Annas, the high priest, and a few leftover priests. They killed them and tossed their bodies over the walls. So I suppose if you didn't die by a sword, getting thrown over a wall, <laughs> you'd probably finish it off when you hit the ground. No, let's come down here to the next paragraph. When uh, Simon came back to Jerusalem, he wanted to subdue the other two factions. In other words, there were three priests and they each one had their own little team. And he wanted to get rid of, two, he wanted to get rid of two of those teams and have them all be in favor of him. And so they were called the Zealots, and John fought each other. The Zealots and John fought each other. Uh, the Zealots were a group of priests of people who were very filled with zeal and excitement to do things. And then John fought with them, and they burned part of the city, including the stored up wheat. Well, that's a nice little sentence, isn't it? All this destruction going on. Just think of that little uh, note. You're not going to be able to buy any bread. They burned the wheat. It's just amazing. It's first, that period of 70, with some of those emperors and generals and, uh, and Josephus running around. And outside of that hall, at the same time going on, was Paul, and Paul was preaching. And some people feel that Paul was killed about that time. But it's just amazing to think of 
all these different things. Man, if we were walking back there, we could get a headline in the New York Times every morning. But we wouldn't want to risk it. Because probably the newspaper people of the day would be responsible for the content of what they were writing. And if they were, said someone was killed, people would say, well then, what did you do to help kill him or help stop him? I mean, it, it was really a hard time for people to be alive and fighting. Well, if people were running wild. Titus offered them an, arm, uh, an armistice, the city for himself, and the temple for the city. That's what he said. But then the Jews thought that a, that was a sign of weakness, and so they rejected it. And the battle continued in the old city. But now Josephus, in the ranks of the Romans, and it's plain that no longer can he be on both sides. It's plain that Josephus was a Roman agent, a secret agent for the Romans. And John and Simon executed anyone trying to flee. So you couldn't even run away from the trouble because they catch you and cut your head off. Further, the wealthy were targeted, saying that they intended to flee. So if they intended to flee, well, it's just as good as if they had fled. Would that fit in law today? Would that fit in law, law when you say, this guy intends to flee? Well, let's kill him because he intends it. He doesn't flee. You'd have to wait to actually get running. <laughs> okay, now, somebody was not doing well. Uh, let's see, the Jewish Jews dug a tunnel under the wall and under the tower, and the tower collapsed. Can you imagine this great big tower, and you dig a little tunnel underneath of it, would dig it under it, it no longer has any foundation, and that whole tunnel, the tower right around the walls of Jerusalem collapsed. Then we get here, uh, Titus and his generals walked through the temple up to the sanctuary, to the Holy of Holies. Gentiles were tracking Jewish blood on their sandals through the Holy Temple. But now, the whole temple mountain was enclosed in flames. The temple vanished stone by stone. Not one was left on top of the other. The other day, my son sent me a picture of a gold coin found just recently in Jerusalem in one of the excavations solid gold coin mm. and I'm not sure uh, which general or which empire emperor's picture was on it but uh, they really made a lot of fuss of it and even got in New York Times okay John tried to escape this isn't John the apostle there's another John one of the soldiers there he tried to escape through the underground tunnels. I mean, I wouldn't get under some of those tunnels. I mean, you, you have these great big stone walls, weigh tons and tons, and you draw, draw, dip, draw a little tunnel under the tunnel, the weight of the walls is going to collapse, make them collapse, push them right in. Well, John tried to escape through one of those underground tunnels, but was captured. Simon made a dramatic surrender, dressed in white. He appeared suddenly above ground. He asked to be taken to the leader of the Romans. He was shackled, chains put around his ankles so he couldn't run away. And then 
in Rome a victory parade was meant with many Jewish prisoners. And some of the stuff from the Jewish temple the Roman soldiers took back to, Jew to Rome and had pictures made of them in a triumphal entry coming back into Rome with these utensils from the Jewish temple. Well, Titus became the emperor. First, he was the general. Then he became the leader of the Jerusalem area. And then he became an emperor and then died in 81. And Domitian took over. He died in 96. And I think I have Domitian's picture. So I'm going to get the coins next week and we can at least look at them and see what these guys look like. Mm -hmm. And during his cruel reign, John, the beloved apostle was exiled to the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. Everybody said, here's John. He was one of Jesus' favorites. He, he was a nice guy. We won't cut his head off. Let's just put him out in this island. He can't go anywhere. He can't swim that far. It's far enough off the land that he couldn't get there. We'll leave him there. But in while he was there, he made good use of his time. Do you know what he did out there? He wrote the book of Revelation in the island of Patmos. And all those other things were going on. And he sits down and quietly writes the book of Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he was writing those kind of things. And people were just amazed that John, who started out in early life writing the gospel, and then later on as he got older, writing those three short letters, and then doing the book of Revelation. Quite a writer. And he just took every opportunity to glorify Christ. Well, uh, let's see. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it. For the glory of God is its light, and the lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. So as we go through the time period, and remember, I'm trying to cover in this uh, series of time would be, I want us to know some people who lived in the first 300 years. And we're not going to get all the way through church history down to modern times. But we do want to get to the first three centuries because there's some amazing people and some people, we don't know their names, but there were a lot of strong Christians. And the Christian women were just unbelievably committed to principle living for Christ. Well, we'll take this thing and just go over next week as we begin the siege of Jerusalem from 60 to 70 A.D., and we'll work on that and uh, see if we can make friends with some of these guys. And some of them don't make friends with them. <laughs> They're too dangerous. Okay? Yeah. Okay? Good. Before we try to get into this week's uh, lecture and discussion, I just want to um, just go. Let's go to la let's go to last week's um, 
I just want to bring up Jerry and uh, Rose to speak. We're studying Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is not the Gospels. And last week, we looked at the Synoptic Gospels, and they call them Synoptic because they're very similar. So there's similar information in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Jesus is depicted as king, Messiah, and Matthew. In Mark, he's Jesus as servant. And then in Luke, Jesus as the son of man. Uh, so as we study these, uh, it's important to realize that uh, there's a lot of similar information uh, in all of these particular uh, particular gospels. And we chose a reading from Luke, and this is chapter 1, verse 1 of Luke, and we relied upon this heavily last week to kind of lay the groundwork for some of the studying that we're going to be doing and some of the reasons how the Gospels came together. So I'm going to read this to you, and it says the introduction. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So basically, what Luke is writing here is he's explaining that there are other uh, there are other resources that were used in compiling Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, uh, if we can get up the uh, diagram of the arrows with Q, this is a very simple diagram, but it's a very important diagram. Because if you read what I just read to you, this part of Luke, where Luke is talking about, there are other, uh, there's other sources that have been written about the life of Jesus, and now I'm going to undertake a writing and putting things together after I've went through this, and uh, he writes carefully, investigated everything from the beginning, and then talked to eyewitnesses. So we know that Luke is saying in his gospel that there's a body of material or material that I was able to look and review in order to uh, bring together my gospel. So we have Mark, which we believe was the first gospel. We have Luke, which we believe is the second gospel written and time-wise. And, 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 and Matthew, um, actually, I think it's the other way around. But... Um, Matthew is most of the time considered the last, uh, and this Q, which is all these papers and documents that Luke relied upon, uh, Matthew relied upon it too. So I just wanted to at least uh, go through the material that we have last week. I can't spend too much time on that, but I just wanted to at least bring you up to date a little bit about these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how they're similar, how much of them share the same sources, meaning uh, Mark... Uh, a lot of Mark is used in Luke and Matthew. Uh, part of Matthew is in Luke and part of Luke is in Matthew. So these gospel writers uh, had materials available to them that they were able to look at, uh, to review, and then carefully uh, put together and compile the gospels. But they're all very different in a way. Although they're very similar, they're, they're written from different perspectives. And we're going to be able to uh, talk about those perspectives as we go on. So I just wanted to briefly just bring you up to date with it. I know we have a lot to cover tonight. So uh, you can read the materials, and as time goes on, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. But the main thing that you want to uh, garner from last week's lecture uh, are that the Gospels are similar, and they're writing from different perspectives, but they share much of the same information. Uh, we believe Mark was the first Gospel written, but we also believe that there is these other resources that were used possibly by Mark too. Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and, and, and to compiling uh, the Gospels that we have uh, now. There's a lot of reliability. We said last week that just because uh, there are other sources that were relied upon uh, should not impinge up upon uh, the uh, authorship and inspiration of the written documents. So how it comes together, you know, we don't know. We'll never know for sure how it all came together. We believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit and God, uh, moved on these men to, to write these things, and then it came together and was codified. Uh, we may not have all the answers to those questions, but we can generally talk about the process by which the Synoptic Gospels came together, and that's what we discussed last week. And we, we laid a very strong case uh, that there's inherent reliability in, in the Gospels, there's inherent consistency in the Gospels, 
Uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a uh, conflict at all that I can gather from the Gospels. And they were written similar but from different perspectives. And that's why you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have three different men wrote from three different perspectives to reach three different groups of people. So it's a beautiful and wonderful uh, writings to read them together and study them together, and that's what we'll be doing. But tonight we're going to be talking about, we're going to be getting into the birth narratives. And here on the cover of Newsweek magazine several years ago, uh, it said the birth of Jesus... Faith and history, how the story of Christmas came to be. Well, I guess it must be true if it's on the cover of Newsweek magazine that Jesus really does exist, and I guess that's uh, his mother Mary. And uh, they put this on, uh, this beautiful picture uh, on the cover of their magazine. So uh, that's what we'll be talking about tonight, the birth or the infant narratives. Now, Jesus, this Jesus as the new Moses. There's a lot of... Uh, similarities between Jesus and Moses. I actually wrote, I was asked uh, uh, to write a paper on this subject matter. Uh, a rabbi from the uh, New York, uh, New York, I forget exactly the name of the school, but it's a big uh, Jewish rabbinical school uh, in Manhattan. Uh, and he had wanted to know about the mediation of Christ. He knew that I was studying under George Hunsinger. Uh, and he wanted me to write a paper uh, analyzing the mediation of Moses and the mediation of Christ and compare and contrast the two. And I actually wrote a fairly good paper uh, on that and, and, and gave it to him, and he thought it was quite good uh, and quite interesting. And, of course, my, my theory was that Moses was a great mediator and one of the greatest mediators uh, that God had ever appointed, but there was a, a better mediator uh, in Jesus Christ, and, and that was the, the, pretty much the ending. But I actually turned that into a chapter in the book uh, that's that I'm working on uh, to get uh, published, and uh, it, I think the title of the chapter was uh, Moses, the Old Mediation, and Christ, the New Mediation, or Better Mediation. So uh, it's interesting, but uh, this brings up that point again, that there's a lot of similarities between Jesus and Moses. Have you ever done a study of Jesus and Moses and comparing the two? And there's a lot of a lot of similarities and a lot of interesting things. I just There's just a few that I have here, but the birth narrative... Uh, you know, both had to be hidden from uh, the authorities, right? When Moses was born, you know, they wanted to kill the baby, and they had to put him in, the, uh, in that little basket and float him down the river to save his life. And really the same thing with Jesus, that Jesus had to be, uh, uh, you know, hidden uh, for fear of death, and we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, both, in a way, were lawgivers, right? I mean, Moses gave the law that God had given him, and then Jesus came and really explained what the law meant, meaning uh, the example would be, you know, Moses said, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? Uh, and, you know, that was one of the commandments. And then Jesus said, well, let, what does it really mean to commit adultery? And so Jesus went to the heart of each particular of the commandments, and in a way he was a lawgiver. Uh, they both received revelation uh, from God uh, on mountain areas, uh, Sinai, and then when Jesus, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, or the Sermon on the Plain, uh, you know, they both went away uh, many times to be alone with God. I mean, we see Jesus, uh, you know, Moses would always go up to the mountain and, and pray and, and, and fellowship with God. And we know that Jesus, uh, during uh, the last time, really during his whole uh, ministry period, was alone with God many times. Uh, Jesus does not abandon the law, but fulfills it. Uh, he actually reinterprets the law against the Pharisees, which is interesting. And I think uh, Moses was trying to have the same uh, problem with Pharaoh. But... Um, so when we talk about these infancy narratives, did you know that there are two infancy narratives in the Gospels that tell the story of Jesus' birth? There's two of them, Matthew and Luke, and they're very, uh, in a way they're very different, different, but they're very similar. Matthew's account narrates the visit of the wise men from the east, the slaughter of the holy innocents by Herod, and the flight of the holy family into Egypt. So Matthew gives, I think, uh, more of an account in his uh, in his birth narratives than Luke does. Uh, Luke's account narrates the story of Jesus being born in a manger because there was no room in the inn and the appearance of the angels uh, and the shepherds. So uh, those are some of the differences and we'll actually get into, you'll be able to see uh, the differences for yourself. Uh, some facts and overview of the two Gospels that we're talking about right now. We're talking about Matthew uh, and Luke. We're not talking about Mark yet because we're talking about the, uh, the birth or infancy narratives as they're referred to. There are two sets of genealogies of Jesus in the Gospels. So you probably wondered when you read this, one seems to be backwards, and the other seems to go from, uh, from older to new, and then the other one goes from newer to older. It's kind of confusing. Uh, there's a reason for that. We're going to talk about that later. 
there are two sets of genealogies uh, of Jesus in the Gospels that are different from one another. The Gospel of Matthew has the genealogy as the opening of the entire book as a prelude to the birth story of Jesus. I like the way Matthew wrote this. He did this first, and then he gets into everything else, where Luke didn't do it that way. Now, I think that probably Matthew did that because he was writing to a more of a Jewish audience, and that would be more accepted in the writing. The Gospel of Matthew has the genealogy as the opening of the entire book as to a prelude to the birth story of Jesus. So uh, you have this, this lineage, and then you have his birth. This is a typical Jewish genealogy descending from the furthest ancestor to the most recent member. So we'd go back to Abraham and then to Jesus, right? Now Luke does it differently. The Gospel of Luke has a genealogy in chapter 3. So there's two big chapters before you even get to the genealogy. You may go through Luke and say, where's the genealogy of Jesus? And you can't find it. Uh, but it's in chapter 3. The Gospel of Luke has a genealogy in chapter 3 just before Jesus begins his public ministry, I think in chapter 4. This is a, a more Greek genealogy, beginning with the life of Jesus and reaching back to the furthest ancestor. If, well, I'm not going to get into all that today, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Let me show you something that I, I, I drew up myself. I've always had trouble with the genealogies, and you, I don't know if you've studied the genealogies, but I've, I've, I've spent some time studying the genealogies, I guess evidently, because I have nothing else better to do. But... Um, I wanted to come up with like a simple chart for, uh, for class so you could kind of understand it because it, it, it's quite complicated. And if you really start to get into it and dig into it, it, it gets a little confusing. But I, I tried to break it down, and I'm not saying that this is exactly the right way to do it or perfectly, it, you can't make tweaks to it, but I wanted to keep it very simple, but I wanted to keep it uh, generally applicable and understandable. So you have the two lines. You have Matthew's line and you have Luke's line, right? So traditionally, uh, they would say that Matthew father, uh, follows the father's line, and then Luke follows the mother's line, right? Now, the confusing thing was is that if you think about that, well, if Matthew's line follows the father's line, then all men should be named in Matthew's line, but there's a lot of women named in Matthew's line. And then in Luke's line, if it's following the, the mother's line, you should have more women in in Luke's uh, genealogy, but you have a lot of men in, in Luke's genealogy. But you have to remember that that in Matthew's line, uh, it's it's they, they, they name most of the fathers all the way through the line to Joseph, and some sporadic women are mentioned uh, in Matthew's genealogy. But Joseph had a mother and a father, uh, as you know. Uh, and but most of the time, it's just the father that's listed in Matthew's line. And this line is important and significant because remember, if Matthew was, his gospel was written to largely a Jewish audience. So Matthew would want to be meticulous and to explain that this Jesus is heir to the throne from a legal standpoint. Right? So that's really important. That would be important to the Jews because the Jews would want to trace a genealogy like they would, are you in line of David? Right? That would be the key question. Are you in line to the throne uh, from David. So the answer to the question, if you follow Matthew's line, uh, would be yes. Uh, actually, uh, uh, to Luke's line, would be yes. See, this, this would be legally. He would be, if, if this wasn't here, and you just had this genealogy, Jesus would have a legal right to the throne. If you didn't have this one, I think this one really is more important because it has the line of King David. So this would be very, uh, and that would be really, I think, a more important genealogy the line of King David from David. I mean, we have two genealogies, right? right? We have Matthew's genealogy, which follows the father's line. Right. We have Luke's genealogy, which really follows the mother's line. Right. Uh, there are some women mentioned in this genealogy. There's also some men and women mentioned in this genealogy. You have a right to the legal throne through the, through the father's line, but I think more importantly, the mother's line is the more important the line. The father's line for... The Matthew's recording is Joseph, who's not the real father. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that. But yeah, you're you're right. This is this is this is really he would if Jesus. What I'm sorry. Well, I don't, I don't want you to get too far ahead because we're gonna get we're gonna get to that later. Mm -hmm. But basically, right right now, what you have to know is that there's the two lines, and one is the legal right to the throne, and then this is the the line of King David. And I would think that this line is really more significant. Luke's genealogy is more significant than than Matthew's. And we'll and we'll explain I, why. 
I disagree with you. But okay. You can, but you may you may find later that it makes more sense. You may find later that there's a point you might disagree with. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't you hold that thought and we'll get to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the birth narrative, Matthew's birth narrative, it says that angels tell Joseph that Jesus will be born, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, that they'll see this Jesus a star and tell Herod, they're going to tell Herod, uh, the seers, and then Herod, of course, plots to uh, kill Jesus. Uh, the Magi follow the star to Bethlehem, and they bring Jesus gifts. Uh, Joseph is warned of Herod in a dream. Jesus' family flees to Egypt. We know that story. And then Herod massacres the infants at Bethlehem, which is called the Massacre of the Innocents, when they uh, kill all the, the boys, what is it, uh, two years old or younger, I think. Uh, Joseph learns Herod's death in a dream so they can return, but he's afraid to go ju to Judea, so he makes Nazareth his home. So this is kind of a, a short synopsis of everything that really occurs uh, in Matthew's birth narrative, and we're going to read all of these things later on, so I don't want to spend uh, too much time on it. But let's look at some differences. Uh, well, you know, there's similarities, but there's differences too. But Luke's birth narrative, an angel tells Mary that Jesus will be born. That's interesting, right? Because an angel tells Joseph that Jesus will be born. So that's kind of interesting, if you think about it, because, you know, Matthew's genealogy uh, is, is really from the, the father's line, right? The angel tells Joseph that Jesus will be born. And then you have Luke. This narrative is really following the mother's line. And the angel tells Mary uh, that Jesus will be born. That's really interesting. And then we have uh, the song, Mary Magnificent. Uh, Mary sings a song of praise to God, which you probably read before. It's a beautiful song, and we'll read that uh, in class. The census forces Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem, so now uh, they're, they're moving again. There's no room at the inn, so Jesus is born in a manger in Bethlehem. The angels tell nearby shepherds of Jesus' birth, and they come and visit. About a month later, Jesus is presented at the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, Simeon and Anna praise Jesus as a redeemer. Uh, I've actually argued this point that, uh, that Israel has acknowledged Jesus Christ as the Messiah and Savior. Uh, and they, he, they stand, these two people, Simeon and Anna, are very significant uh, players uh, or people in the, in the New Testament, although they're saints of old. And I've argued that uh, Israel has received the Messiah. They've received Christ as Redeemer based upon uh, Simeon and Anna's proclamation of faith. And now we're just kind of waiting for Israel to catch up to Simeon and Anna. But that promise is circular. Well, it'll, it'll all come back as Paul wrote, and uh, we talked about it in the book of Romans. So Jesus' family returns to their home in Nazareth. So that's, that's kind of like a, a general outline uh, of Matthew's narrative and Luke's narrative. Now here's where it gets a little dicey. And this is where I, I think that um, I think it's the most fascinating thing that we're going to talk about tonight. So through Joseph's line, Jesus received the legal right to be the king. Okay, so he technically has a legal right to be the king. If, if we didn't have Mary's, and I'm trying to let you kind of forget about Mary's genealogy right now, but just based upon uh, Joseph's genealogy. But there's a problem with the genealogy of Joseph. And the problem is that there's a curse in the genealogy of Joseph. And I, it was... I couldn't figure out why that curse was so significant, but it's, it's mentioned in Jeremiah 22, uh, verses 28 to 30. And I'm going to actually find that if I can. And uh, if somebody has it, let me see if I can get it real quick. Jeremiah 22. Give me a second, I'll find it. 22. If somebody gets it faster, then they can let me know. 22. Verse 28. Verse 22 and 28. Here it is. Okay. Jeremiah 22, verse 28 to 30. Is this man, Joachim, see it? Joachim? I don't know how actually the pronunciation would be. Joachimian? Joachimian? It's actually spelled differently in different Bibles, so it's hard to get a correct, correct, correct pronunciation. That's spelled differently than what this Bible has. But this man, Jokachin, a despised, broken pot, an object no one wants, why will he and his children be hurled out, cast into a land they do not know? O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. 
This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule any more in Judah. So this is really significant. This is something extraordinary. Here we have Joseph's line to Jesus, and the Bible is clearly telling us that this line has some problems with it. Because there's a curse. And there's a curse in there, and that nobody from this line, from his line starting here, is going to sit on the throne of David. So that's very problematic at first. But let's, let's keep on going and we're going to get to this. Now through Mary's line, Jesus received the physical right to be the king. Abraham, uh, Adam, Abraham, David, Heli, Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. So that's the key, right? So conceived by the Holy Spirit. So there's no issue in the genealogy that Luke lays out. Everything is kind of perfectly flows together, and he is the right, he is from the line of David, right? He is every, but this person isn't in this line. This is more of a clean line and more of the better line, I think, if you have to make a decision, because this line is cursed. And then, to, to, then the icing on the cake is this, that we know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not Joseph, right? So there, in a way, there's not a, there's not a physical connection in this genealogy, right? Because this father did not have that son. So, what that means is that this, this line of being cursed really has no application or effect on Jesus being a son of David or in line to the throne of David and being the rightful king of Israel. Fascinating, right? Yes. Well, I mean, look, it, it, it took a while to figure this out, and you got to bear with me because I haven't totally flushed it all out, but there's clearly a curse, and there's the curse. Now let's go to the curse. Matthew traces the line through Solomon to Jeconian. Jeconian was the last and evil king on whom God pronounced a curse. He was a horrible, unbelieving king. And I think that God just said, I'm not letting this guy be one of the last kings before Messiah comes. So Jeremiah 22, 29, there's the curse. So this kind of gets stopped here. And it becomes a problem in that genealogy. So, when we talk about the genealogies, they're, they're both very important. They're in the Bible, but clearly there's a particular issue with one of the genealogies based upon biblical interpretation. And I think, if you're asking me what my opinion is on it, I think that God wanted to solidify several things with that. Number one, that no man from Joseph's line could take credit to say, that's my seed. The seed came from God and the Holy Spirit. And there's a difference between, how many people know the difference between the immaculate reception, inception, and the virgin birth? A lot of people do not know the difference between the two. And they're very important for you to know. So I've written it down and kind of outlined that... There's a, there's a doctrine, basically a Catholic doctrine, that basically says that the immaculate conception refers to Mary, not to Jesus. That Mary was saved from sin her whole life and was in a way sinless. Now we know that that's not correct because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the only person that ever lived the sinless life was in fact Jesus. So we know that the immaculate uh, conception did not refer to uh, Mary, but the virgin birth referred to Jesus. Without human agency, the Holy Spirit brought forth the baby in the womb of Mary. Now, was Mary to be highly recognized and righteous? I'm sure that the Lord picked the most righteous Jew woman that he could find, that he knew that he would deposit the seed of the, of, of the Messiah in that particular woman, that she was very special, and uh, she should be venerated, but, but whether there was, uh, I, I probably doubt the Immaculate Conception 
uh, of her. I don't think that that's biblical, and I think it'd be very difficult to find biblical support for that proposition. But most people think the Immaculate Conception refers to when Jesus was conceived uh, in Mary's womb, and it does not. So <clears throat> with that... Uh, you know, the genealogies can get really tricky, and let me tell you, that's a monkey wrench in the genealogy, uh, that one thing. But I think that that's fascinating, and I really wanted to really bring that forth tonight, because it's something that you should know. I mean, do we know the reason why that happened? We don't know the reason why, but we do know that it happened on the right genealogy, not the other one. Yeah. Because Mary's genealogy was very significant, like I said. I think both are important. Both are in there for a reason, but... Joseph did not impregnate his wife, as we all know. So that genealogy really is a secondary genealogy to the primary genealogy mentioned in Luke. At least that's the best synopsis that I can give you without getting, without getting too technical and too confusing, where I might even confuse myself. Um, so why don't we do this? Why don't we go to the infancy narratives? You have the genealogy of Jesus, and... I'm going to read this. It's probably easier for me to read it because there's a lot of words there and it's going to be difficult for all of us to read it. But uh, I'll read the genealogy. And then what we're going to do, if you look at the infancy narratives, you see Matthew on the left-hand side. You see there's nothing in Mark. So Mark doesn't have any uh, infancy narrative uh, as far as the genealogy is, is concerned. And then in the right column, you see Luke. So this is how, when you study the Synoptic Gospels, this is how you do it. You start with whatever the chapter is, you know, hopefully you start at chapter 1, but uh, it doesn't always go that way. It doesn't always go in that particular type of order. It really goes by way of subject matter. So now we have the subject matter of the genealogies. Matthew, we have a genealogy. Mark, we don't have a genealogy. And then in Luke, we have kind of a reverse order genealogy. right? But Luke's genealogies, we just established as Mary's line, and is really uh, more significant. Okay, so let me read to you, uh, and this is how we'll do it. If you go through all the other pages, you'll see on page two that the genealogies continue. Of course, there's nothing in the middle column, which is Mark, and then Luke is to the right. And then you have the birth narrative. So that was uh, only in Matthew is the birth narrative. There's nothing there in Mark, and there's nothing in Luke yet. The visit of the wise men is only found in Mark. I mean, Matthew, not in Mark or Luke. And then the flight to Egypt is only in Matthew, not Mark and Luke. So that's how you read and study the Synoptic Gospels. And then when you get to a portion that's in Mark, it may not be in Matthew or Luke, or Luke, and it may not be in Matthew and Mark. So that's how Synoptic Gospels, it's a little confusing. Am I being too confusing tonight with this? Okay. Because it's going to be hard to kind of keep it all together. I don't want you to get lost with anything. But let, let me read this, and you can follow along on, the, uh, on your handout. It's the genealogy of Jesus, and we're reading uh, the Matthew infancy narrative, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. So here Matthew clearly states in the first line, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. And he's telling this to the Jews, right? The son of David, the son of Abraham. So, so Matthew does a beautiful job. I mean, Matthew's genealogy is really well done. I mean, he does a great job with it. The only flying the ointment is the fellow that we just met, met just before. But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now usually when you see something like that, something fishy or nefarious is going on, and in that case there was some rape back then uh, with this woman, so you can go back and, and look at that if you want, but you don't really, I think it's in chapter 34 of, um, I forget what book, but it's, I think it's chapter 34. Anyway, uh, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Abinadad, and Abinadad the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. You know, we know who Rahab was, the prostitute. So these names are a little bit familiar to us. And Boaz the father of Obeded by Ruth, and Obeded the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. Now there's 14 generations to that. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. So a lot of times when the women are mentioned in Matthew's genealogy, it's probably... Uh, not for a good reason, okay. But nevertheless, they were um, they were used by God, and they were uh, you know Rahab was uh, used and forgiven by God, you know. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure about uh, the wife of Uriah though, uh, what her situation exactly was. But uh, and Solomon the father of Rohabim, and Rohabim the father of Abijah, 
and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Joshaphat, and Joshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz. A lot of these names we're not familiar with, we don't know, we haven't really read any stories about them, but we have some of them. And Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, which we know, and Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, which we know, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jochin, uh, Jochinian and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon, and that's where the curse came in. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jochinian was the father of Sethaniel, and Sethaniel the father of Zerubbabel, now Zerubbabel was good, and Zerubbabel the father of Abed, and Abidad the father of Elikim, we go into the back, and Elikim the father of Azar, Azar the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Elud, and Elud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen. So, and Mathen the father of Jacob, this is another Jacob, this is not the original Jacob, but Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. So now here is even more support, right? The husband of Mary. He could have said the father of Jesus, right? The father of Jesus, but no, Matthew said the husband of Mary because he understood what was at stake in a lot of these uh, writings of whom Jesus was born. See, the, Jesus was born from Mary, who was called the Messiah. And then it says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So if I, can, I actually counted them all up, and I tried to uh, break it up, but there's 14 and 14 and 14. Very interesting, that number. I don't know why the number is 14. I, I can't figure that out. I don't know what the number is. I'm not a numerologist, and I don't want to try to guess, but there seems to be, uh, it seems to be the same uh, amount of generations. Why God did that, I don't know. I uh, have symmetry uh, or time. I have no idea. And, and I think that we would probably be guessing if we, we tried to, when you, when you go to the numbers, it's very speculative. So anyway, so that's, that's the genealogy of, of, of Matthew, and he lays it out really quite nice. And then on the right-hand side, we're not going to go through all that, but that's Luke's, uh, uh, Luke's um, genealogy, and it goes, actually it goes in reverse order. This book has it, um, if you go, it says Joseph is in verse 24, right? And Abraham is in verse 34. So it actually goes in reverse order, right? You follow that? It just would be, basically, the way they wrote it here in the, in the handout is wrong. It would actually be the other way around, but because they're trying to keep it, they're trying to show you the similarity of the synoptics, they put Abraham with Abraham, you know, and they keep it that way, but it's really the reverse order, so Luke would be reversed. So that's the, a mouthful of genealogies. So hopefully you learned a little bit, I mean, I don't expect you to know everything with this, this is hard. I mean, I, I've been reading this and trying to study this for a long time, and it's very confusing and very complicated. The names are just very complicated to even pronounce the names. But I just wanted you to see that the, the, the most important thing I wanted you to know tonight was the difference in the genealogies, the reasons for the differences in the genealogies, and kind of a theory I threw out to you that there is a problem with one of the genealogies. Not that it's wrong in the Bible. It's, it says it right in the Bible. I think that actually the genealogy supports what's written in the prophecies about the Messiah and about the Messiah's line as found in Jer um, Jeremiah. So it's a really a fascinating thing. Um, you want to take some questions, and then we'll read maybe, uh, actually we'll probably stop, but and then we'll start the birth narratives. Uh, Rich, you guys want to say anything, or...? Well, I was going to just make a point out of the curse. Okay, tell me. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the curse really is a reflection of Jesus, his his mission. Yeah. Because what I said is one or two verses and a little story reflects that he came to be a curse. Jesus did. Curse is he that hangs on a tree. Right. And in the family line of Jesus, not only is that right. individual curse, but you have, as you mentioned before, right out the process. We see imperfection in the man, Jesus the man, and his family. Jesus the man, the humanness of Jesus. Right. And the family, his family, Joseph's family. Right. And that and that is what Jesus is about. He's about redeeming. Redeeming those that have curse. Sure. Redeeming those. I mean I mean, I think that's a really good point. You could, you could preach at it if you got. You, you know what? It, it really shows these genealogies with all their little wrinkles uh, show the humanity. <laughs> 
of, of, of where he came from, they were very imperfect, to say the least. I mean, uh, Tamar was raped. Uh, Rahab was the, the local prostitute. I mean, there's this, you know, uh, Uriah's wife, I mean, you know, Bathsheba, she didn't do the right thing, and God used her to bring forth... I mean, David alone you know, was an yeah. uh, adulterous and a yeah. murderer, yeah. even though God judged him and judged Bathsheba because he lost a child and he right. one child. And then, and then absolutely chased David out of, the king, out of his castle, right. palace. So he was he was judged, but yet we know that David got redeemed at the end. Right. So we see God's grace. Yeah, I, I I think it's beautiful, and I think that these. You know, you don't really pay much attention to the genealogy, but look at look at the gem. We found like an, a, a tremendous gem tonight in, in the genealogies that probably very few people, uh, other than a theologian, would ever know that. I didn't know that until I started uh, to really research it and look into it. You know, I, I think it, it, it's a demonstration in the sense that I was almost using that painfully to show how much God, I mean, Christ was man and came from man at the same time as he came from heaven, so he had that, he had, you know, he teeter-tottered being both at the same time, yeah. or else he wouldn't have made such a big Well, I mean, you got to remember, you know, that that's uh, that gets into the, the homoousius and the, and the substance, and, you know, we just have to remember that Jesus, although he was God, was fully man. He was fully man, fully human, and fully God. I know that's difficult to understand, but... I just have a question. Yeah, sure. Because I'm... Luke, I know it's not reflected here, but I know Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam, mm -hmm. which to me sort of means that he's including all of humanity in Jesus' yeah. genealogy, whereas Matthew only goes back to the beginning of the Jewish people. Right. Don't you think that's a significant... Well, I, I do. I think that's a good. I think that's a very good point. Um, you know, like I said, I think I, I enjoy Matthew's genealogy just the way it's written and the way it goes and the order of how he writes it. But but Luke is very significant. Luke does go back uh, to the very beginning. He goes back to Adam. I mean, he traces Jesus all the way back to Adam. I mean, that's a very. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. It's a very. Um, um, comprehensive thing. I think uh, Luke did a really wonderful job writing this, uh, and it's different. It's a little bit of a different genealogy, and there's a lot of, you know, if you make a list, there's a lot of people in Luke's genealogy that aren't mentioned in uh, Matthew's because it's the mother's line rather than, that, rather than the father's line. You know, it would be like, you know, a uh, husband and wife, you have a mother, and you had a mother and father, and you had a mother and father. Right? And if we traced your family tree on your side, it would be far different than hers, right? Oh, yeah. But the important so, thing is that both of the genealogies go back to David. Well, they, they, they both go back to David, and they both show that Jesus had not only the legal, but also the physical right to the throne of, of Israel. I mean, that's very significant. So, uh, you know, if we got that out of today, Pastor Rob? Uh, just that, on like a bigger picture thought in my head, it's, it's very interesting to me to see <clears throat> the genealogies, because what if, just as a what if, all these problems didn't happen, and the house of David actually stayed as king all the way through. Now Jesus is coming from the palace. Yeah. But That's God broke it down, yeah. and Jesus came from a manger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can almost, you know, that's similar to Moses, right? Moses was yeah. in line to be Pharaoh, yeah. and he left it. You know, the way God works is far different than the way we would work. If we were God, we would come out from the throne. Like Pastor Rob said, we we'd be king. You know, we, you know. Look at if any of us had the, the the lineage or the royal line to a king, we would certainly uh, assert that right. Especially if we were if we were the only remaining or living person to to get that line, which Jesus would have been. Jesus would have been able to proclaim uh, that particular uh, line as king. So uh, it is really interesting, and just it, it just goes to show you when you start to study these things a little bit like we're doing now and kind of spend time with it and percolate with these things. Even the genealogy is fascinating. I mean, uh, I could have spent so much time on the genealogy giving some more information about things, but I just wanted to try to bring out the most important things that are always going to stick in your mind, because when you read this genealogy, you're going to know there's a curse in that line, you know, and also that curse really supports the proposition of the uh, the virgin birth, right? The virgin birth and, and some of the other things, especially with Matthew writes that Joseph was the father, well, what did he write? The, the husband. husband. <laughs> he didn't say the father, the husband of Joseph. The husband of Mary, whom Jesus was born, could have wrote there, the father of Jesus, you know, but he didn't. He was accurate. So if that's it, any other discussion, and then we'll close. It's a little five after nine.
I'm tired from that. <laughs> it took me all week just to put together that little lecture, if you can believe that. Uh, anyway, it just was so confusing trying to work that through and try to draw that little diagram. Uh, it took me more time than I anticipated. But uh, it just goes to show you, sometimes things that you think are going to be simple really become very challenging and very uh, interesting. But next week we're going to read, you know, if you want to, if you guys want to do a little bit of homework, you could read, I guess you guys have pages, uh, I don't know how much, how many pages you have, you probably have until page 7, but you could read pages 2 to 7 if you'd like. And I promised yeah, you also, yeah, yeah, 2 to 7 in this, in the handout, uh, the birth narrative, the flight, the prologue to the gospel, the promise of the Baptist birth, the Annunciation, Mary's visit to Elizabeth, the birth of the Baptist, and the birth of Jesus. So you have some of those. And then what, I, what I'll do also is I promised you that I, I would introduce you to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we're going to meet each one of these uh, synoptic writers uh, through the course. Uh, I didn't have time to do it tonight. Maybe if I have time next week, I'll introduce you to uh, whoever's first on the list. I think it's going to be Matthew. All right, so why don't we end in prayer and we'll get you out of here at 5 after 9. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for these beautiful people to come out here and really learn more about your word. Uh, this is truly a study. Uh, this is not time to uh, uh, kibitz or talk. We're here to read the word of God and, and study and uh, have discussions and questions and, and have sparks fly uh, as we learn together about the person and work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this evening, and we ask that you, you bless all of us tonight. Uh, uh, bless Dr. Kelsey as he travels uh, and goes uh, for some uh, treatment, and also bless him as he comes to preach on Sunday this week. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Have a beautiful night.